In this tutorial series, we're learning how to build a cob house from the foundation all the way through the reciprocal living roof. And so far in this series, we went through a basic overview of the building processes and how to build a rubble trench foundation. In this episode, we'll be learning about how to pour a base of an earthen floor using a mixture of clay, sand, straw, and gravel. There are many variations of earthen floors, but for the most part, you want to create four main layers. First, you have your gravel drainage layer, then your insulation layer, followed by your earthen floor base, and then your final floor layer. Like cob walls, earthen floors are very dense and have a high thermal mass. So since we're in the northern hemisphere, we take advantage of a passive solar design by putting the majority of our large windows in the solar south walls. This will allow the floor to directly absorb the heat from the low angle sun in the winter time and slowly release this heat throughout the night. In the last episode, we left off halfway through day five as we cleaned up the building site and prepared to start leveling the base of our earthen floor. Before you begin leveling out the base of the earthen floor, you'll need to establish reference points that will tell you how much to dig in certain areas and how much to infill in others. The first step of this process is to calculate the total depth of the earthen floor, and in our case we'll be using 10 inches as our reference, which will give us roughly 4 inches of drainage rock, half an inch of cardboard insulation, 4 inches of earthen floor base, and an inch and a half of our final finished floor. For this build, we want the top of the finished earthen floor to be flush with the top of our stone threshold. So to do this, we made a somewhat arbitrary mark on the door frame at 10 centimeters or 4 inches above the top of the stone threshold. And we then transferred this mark at several reference points around the foundation using a tool called a water level. Once we established several reference points, we used rebar and string to create string lines that were level and spanned the entire building. All of these level string lines represent the total 10 inch depth of our earthen floor, plus the 4 inches that we marked on the door frame above the threshold. So now we can go around with a measuring tape, and areas that are less than 14 inches would need to be dug out, and areas that are more than 14 inches would need to be infilled. We again use shovels, mattocks, and spades to dig the areas that were too high, checking with a measuring tape periodically to ensure that we were digging to our desired level. You can see that as we dug out the high areas, we also filled in the low areas to bring them up to level with our 3 quarter inch clean stone. It's important for the entire floor that you're building on sturdy ground, free of organic matter and topsoil. Something to also keep in mind is that for areas that need to be infilled, you will have a better result if you infill with solid stone as opposed to trying to raise the grade with loose soil. Similarly to our foundation, we don't want the floor to settle over time, which could lead to cracking. We continued digging, raking, measuring, and leveling, and this is where we were at as day 5 came to a close. Coming into day 6, we had the base of our earthen floor leveled and tamped and we were ready to start infilling our gravel drainage layer. We gathered more of our 3 quarter inch clean stone and we also constructed this temporary ramp that made bringing materials in and out much easier. As we continued bringing in gravel, we raked it out evenly and then tamped it until it was well compacted. Since our string lines were now 14 inches above the level subsoil, filling the drain rock to a 10 inch measurement from the string line would give us our desired 4 inches of drainage. Once the floor was full of gravel, we compacted everything one more time and then we used a straight board with a level to make fine adjustments where needed. After tamping the areas that were a little bit too high and placing a few handfuls of stone in the areas that were too low, we were ready to start installing our insulation layer. We chose to use cardboard for our insulation layer on this build, which serves two main purposes. The air gaps between the layers of cardboard help to insulate the floor and it also creates a barrier between the drainage rock and the poured earthen floor to ensure that the drainage rock stays clean and functional. 
Once the cardboard was all laid out, we made a clay slip by mixing our clay soil with water and breaking up all the chunks. We then applied the slip on top of all the cardboard which would act as a natural binder to help ensure that the earthen floor mix bonds strongly with the insulation layer. Now that the floor was all prepared, we were ready to make our earthen floor base mix. For this mix, we used six parts of our gray sand, in this case decomposed granite, the one part of our clay soil, and half a part of our three quarter inch clean stone. We found that the ratios on the right side of this diagram were appropriate for mixing each batch in our wheelbarrows. Once you've added your clay, sand, and gravel, you'll want to dry mix the materials until they're homogenous. You can then begin gradually adding your water and continue mixing thoroughly. In the next video of this series, we'll be going over how to test your soil, make test bricks, and mix cob. So for now, I'll keep the explanation of this mix somewhat brief. As a basic guideline though, we found our strongest cob brick to be a mixture of three sand to one clay. And we then doubled the sand in our earthen floor ratio because your floor needs to have a stronger compressive strength. In this mix, the sand and gravel are our structural elements, the clay soil bonds the mix together, and the straw helps to create added tensile strength. When practicing natural building, it's better to use ratios as references as opposed to recipes because the earth's soil varies so vastly. The amount of water you add is based on feel, and generally the mix should be wet enough that it bonds together and can easily be moved around, but you don't want it so wet that it's soupy. Once all of the materials are thoroughly mixed, the final step is to add your straw. We used roughly a basketball sized ball of straw in each batch of our mix, and you want to carefully integrate the straw so that you don't break each of the strands. The longer solid straws will mean that you have a higher tensile strength. Now that our mix was prepared, we were ready to start pouring our earthen floor base layer. You can see here that we brought in batches of earthen floor mix and wheelbarrows and we started pouring the floor from the side of the building opposite to the entryway. We are using straight 2x4s as screed boards to establish a consistent depth throughout the floor. You want to use your screed boards intentionally by partitioning workable areas one section at a time. You want to fully integrate the earthen floor mix by pushing through the mix with your fingers, releasing any air gaps, and making sure that the mix is homogenous throughout. You can then begin smoothing the mix out with the palm of your hand. If you feel that there are areas that are too low, you can grab extra mix from the edge and compact it on top. Once you're satisfied with shaping it by hand, you can begin checking your level by running your level parallel to your screed board and shaking it side to side to even everything out. You can then come back over the top with a flat board, float, or trowel to flatten the surface on the top. For this process, your most accurate reference for the depth is directly above your screed board, so you want to start from there and work your way out. Throughout this process, continue checking for level from various angles and adding more mix where necessary. You can then continue on by adding more mix to each section, repeating the processes throughout until a section is full. As a final touch to each section, you can use a metal trowel on a slight slant to create a smooth finish. As you continue working the mix, you'll notice that the clay and water rise to the surface of the floor. If there are areas where lots of water is pooling, it may mean that that area has a low spot that needs to be added to. Generally, it's best to pour the entire floor in one go without taking any breaks in between because you want the entire floor to dry seamlessly at the same rate. We had teams making more earthen floor mix while others poured the actual floor. You can see here that we're now using multiple screed boards to create more workable sections. And as we finish one section, we pull the screed board out and place it again to make another workable section. An important next step is to fill the gaps from where the screed boards were laying and to thoroughly break down all your hard edges that you can then build back up with new mix. 
These seams are one of the most likely places that you'll see cracking in the floor if you fail to integrate them properly. We continued integrating the new mix with our fingers, troweling it flat, and removing boards as we completed sections. Our temporary tarp structure came in handy once again as the rain came falling down. As you finish troweling everything flat, it's a good idea to continue checking and making sure that your floor is level. As the water continues rising to the surface, the floor will have this beautiful shine. The working areas continue getting smaller and smaller and smaller until finally you're done. We pour the finish layer on the earthen floor on the very last day of the build, so we'll touch back on that further in the series. As we mentioned, in next episode we'll focus on testing your soils, creating various test bricks, and how to make a cob mix, so be sure to subscribe and follow along for the rest of the build.